Lecture 26, Profilers and Profiler Guided Optimization. We'll start off by talking about some different profiling tools that are uh, available. Uh, some may or may not be installed on uh, the systems uh, that are controlled by the EC department, but uh, it'll be interesting to think about some of the ideas uh, about profiling and what's different and what's interesting about different profilers. Uh, this is by no means an extensive list, so keep in mind this is amongst our profiling tools of such diverse elements as, as opposed to you know, complete certainty that this is all of them and everything is amazing. Um, your tools are typically aware of the whole system, but you're usually focused in our case on one particular application. This is, as I said, usually because, uh, at least for uh, our purposes in the course, uh, we don't have the uh, administrative rights on the servers needed. Uh, uh, to actually do full system profiling, but we definitely can, if it's our own laptop at least. Um, so there's a couple that I'm going to talk about um, just super briefly, uh, and then we'll uh, look at a couple things in slightly more detail. Um, but Solera Studio Performance Analyzer, um, Intel's VTune, uh, and the AMD Code Analyst. So each of these, again, just gets a brief mention. Uh, the uh, Performance Analyzer from, well, it was Solera Studio, now it's Oracle, I guess, uh, supports GProf-style profiling, so it does sampling uh, and kernel-level profiling by hooking in with another uh, product that we're going to talk about, Dtrace. Uh, at a process level, it is, again, uh, pretty extensive. Uh, I would say it's better than uh, GProf. Um, and if I mean, we didn't talk about GProf, but it's the Google Performance Tools, um, and it includes things like reading the uh, CPU performance counters, and you can also use it on Java. Um, since locks and concurrency are important, um, the Solera Studio Performance Analyzer tracks the amount of time waiting for locks, which could actually tell you something interesting about your application, uh, and we'll come back to the subject of, of that uh, in just a bit. Uh, the Intel uh, and AMD versions, they both provide profiling tools. Um, VTune costs money. Uh, Code Analyst is free software. Uh, and uh, Intel uses the term event-based sampling to refer to uh, what we have called the you know, statistical profiling, the idea of taking a sample every so often after a certain number of CPUs events. Uh, and uh, time-based sampling also is something we would have ca called statistical profiling to uh, you know, make it periodic every X number of milliseconds. So there's a distinction there uh, in the uh, Intel version, which makes it possible to say, oh, I want to be notified every time there are you know, 10 multiplications, if for some reason you care about number of multiplications, uh, rather than just profiling on a periodic basis based on you know, elapsed time. VTune can also um, correlate behavior of counters with other things, like it knows how to check for disk workload, uh, and sampling modes contain um, the behavior of the operating system, even though you might only be able to view some limited detail about that. Um, VTune will give you instrumentation-based profiling if you ask it, uh, where, where it measures the time spent in each procedure. Um, and it will also actually tell you um, what it thinks the top problems with your software are. So it's not just analysis, but it also makes recommendations. How useful those recommendations are depends a lot on the nature of the program you're analyzing, as well as your ability to understand the architecture uh, that is being executed. Otherwise, the information it's giving you is like, okay, cool, thanks, bye. Right, the AMD version uh, is, uh, well, the Linux version of it at least is released under the GPL. Uh, and uh, Mozilla, at least at one time, used to recommend uh, submitting code analyst profiling when, uh, when reporting a performance problem. Uh, and it is a system-wide profiler, which allows you, if you want, to drill down into a specific program and or library. Um, and uh, unfortunately, though, that does mean sometimes if you are interested in looking at a particular uh, process, uh, if, if you're just watching the whole system broadly, you might not see the one you're looking for because it has to show up often enough to appear in the profile. 
Um, and uh, for most programs, if you're trying to analyze you know, the release version, uh, those come without debug symbols, but you have the option sometimes to download those from the internet. Uh, sometimes a big open source project will generate you know, just the uh, debug symbols that you need, uh, and you can take a look at those and use them in conjunction with your profiler to say, yeah, aha, if I combine these things, then it makes names more meaningful and you don't just get random you know, assembly with you know, hex addresses uh, and nothing you can really work with uh, in a practical sense. So that's good. Um, the uh, code analyst documentation uh, talks about event-based profiling and time-based profiling and instruction-based sampling. Um, the sampling mode is uh, every every period ask how what's going on right now how you doing program uh, and it works on all processors the other modes are event-based profiling and instruction-based sampling and they're interrogating the hardware performance counters presumably uh, it also requires uh, an AMD processor uh, to get some certainty about what's going on in there um, the code analysts uh, suggestions say that you need to tune your sampling uh, interval such that um, it's high enough to capture useful data and you have to run for long enough to capture uh, enough samples in total. Uh, and the default sampling rate is once every millisecond and they suggest that programs need to run at least 15 seconds to get meaningful data. Uh, that is to say, um, if the program runs shorter than that, you might not capture enough interesting data and uh, what data you do capture might be something that uh, is mostly dominated by the initial conditions you know the uh, setup costs of getting your program started uh, as opposed to actually you know the run that you wanted to observe uh, the event-based profiling works like VTunes event-based sampling. After a certain number of uh, CPU events occur, then the profiler uh, is going to record the system state, and it will know, aha, you know, this is where cache misses are occurring. Um, but it is important to remember that um, the profiler can't give you necessarily the precise instruction that was the cause of the problem because of things like out-of-order execution and... Uh, because of that, it gives you kind of a range. It's like, I think it was in here somewhere, uh, suggesting that, you know, there's a, a spread where, uh, okay, it was one of these, whichever one it is, depends on which uh, instruction actually ended up, you know, retiring first, so to speak. Uh, and you, uh, you make your uh, best estimate uh, as to uh, which, of, which of the ones you think it is. Uh, maybe it wasn't the ad, maybe it was the load, even if the ad somehow appears you know, uh, to be uh, the one at fault, you'll find out. Okay, um, to improve the accuracy of the information that a Code Analyst has, it does use AMD-specific hardware features to watch for um, x86 instructions that it knows are interesting, uh, and then their associated backend instructions, which they call ops, that's the you know, internal actually carrying it out uh, steps that aren't uh, super relevant to you uh, as somebody who is just writing code and having it compiled to assembly. But if you need to uh, go deeper in that, then, yep, that's that's where it breaks down. Uh, and um, AMD even provides an example here um, where the uh, instruction-based sampling specifies this is a particular instruction that is the problem. Uh, in, it has to do with data translation look aside buffer misses um, while the event based profiling says well it could be one of these four instructions that's guilty uh, so the uh, instruction based one does allow you to narrow it down uh, at least a little bit more okay um, that gives us our brief overview of tools that we're not going to look into um, too much uh, and uh, now we're going to talk about well Dtrace. Uh, and Dtrace is an instrumentation based uh, tool which is uh, supposed to run on production systems. Shocked Pikachu face. Um, typical uh, instrumentation can have a slowdown of something like a hundred times you know, looking at you, Valgrin, um, which seems like it would be incompatible with, um, incompatible with a production system, right? I mean, the the, the performance of your application would just be completely unacceptable at that point, and no one would stand for it, and you, know, you could never do it. And yet, Dtrace does. All right, uh, how? 
Well, um, D-Trace was supposed to be created with a couple of design goals in mind. Number one, no overhead when not in use. Um, and, uh, well, okay, this is potentially achievable. You know, when it's off, it's off. When it's on, it's on. Uh, and number two is guarantee safety, which is you can't cause a crash of any sort. Hmm. How does it do that? Well, um... Well, how does it achieve when uh, overhead? Well, when it's activated, it dynamically rewrites code by putting in a branch to the instrumentation code. Uh, when it's turned off, those branches are removed, so it's as if it's not there uh, and uh, nothing happened, we don't have anything to do. Um, and most of the instrumentation takes place at uh, entry and exit points for the function. Uh, and so you know, there's not a huge cost to doing it. There's you know, the overhead of uh, entering into the function uh, and the overhead of leaving the function, but those are pretty, um, those are pretty small usually, and uh, you know, we can live with that. The other thing is uh, that it can also instrument kernel functions and locking, so you can keep track of like how much time is spent on locking and um, and how much is spent uh, unlocking and that kind of thing. Um, it's no big uh, no big issue as long as again you're an administrator and you have the rights to like poke around in the kernel and stuff like that, uh, and it is great. Um, all right. Um, however, for the probes, I mean, what can you do? Um, well, the limitations of the probes, these are things that you can insert um, into your um, into the start of your function, for example. Uh, that, Like when we do the system call read on entry, we're going to take down a timestamp, uh, and then later when that uh, function returns, uh, we're going to then use that timestamp and you know, take a new one and do a comparison uh, and actually you know, work out how long it took. So this code prints out how long the call to read takes, along with some context saying, you know, hey, here's some uh, process ID and thread ID information and what have you. Now, to limit the possibility that anything goes wrong, the um, limits that are imposed on you and what you can write in one of these probes are very strict. Um, you you can't have a loop because so then there's a possibility of an infinite loop, that kind of thing. Um, trying to dereference a pointer or something, you know, also, also um, nope, uh, you know, there's a possibility that that ends in a segmentation fault or a null pointer exception uh, or something like that. Um, so again, you don't want that. Uh, it is dangerous. So dtrace is very limited in the things that you can add. Uh, you specify the clause that you want using you know, probes, predicates, action statements, um, and um, the action statements execute when the condition specified by the probe holds and the predicate evaluates to true, so it is kind of mathy uh, in how it thinks uh, about, um, uh, about executing a probe, but ultimately the, um, the intention is to keep it uh, as small as possible so that uh, there's no possibility of anything going wrong. Uh, we'll also talk about weight. Uh, and uh, weight is um, another tool that uh, comes from IBM, uh, and it is, uh, well, also intended to be run on production environments, uh, and it's supposed to work with uh, JVM uh, programs. So it hooks into a modern JVM to analyze their idle time, basically figuring out, okay, if we're not executing, what are we doing? What are we, no other way to put it, waiting for? Hence, I think, why it's called wait. Um, and it performs sampling-based analysis of the behavior of the virtual machine, and the samples are actually fairly infrequent. It's one or two uh, per minute, uh, as opposed to something very fast, like every hundred milliseconds, like we've been talking about, or every millisecond in the case of uh, AMD. Uh, and so at each sample, wait records the state of every thread, which includes the call stack and the participation in system locks. Uh, and combining this with some rules, some you know, information uh, that uh, people have observed uh, that were written by experts, uh, we have the ability to uh, put together a wait state. Uh, and a wait state is uh, just a statement about what we think the process currently doing is uh, currently waiting for, what it's doing, what it's waiting for, all those things. Is it waiting for disk? Is it waiting for the garbage collector to run? Is it waiting for network? Is, is a thread blocked because it needs a resource? 
of some sort. Any of those things would be you know, hints for uh, what you might change in your program if you can figure out what you are waiting for. So to use wait, uh, you run your application, you then collect the data, um, either using a script or manually, uh, and you upload the data to IBM's server. This is how they prevent you from uh, you know, doing it just yourself and not paying them. Uh, there, there's the server-side analysis element, uh, which is required for uh, getting meaningful results. Uh, and then once you have such meaningful results, then you can take that uh, and you can work with it, uh, and it provides you a report. Uh, and the report gives you suggestions uh, about what it thinks you could do. Uh, it tells you about uh, you know, the processor utilization, uh, how much time was spent doing garbage collection, uh, how much time was spent idle, those kinds of things, uh, and um, thread states, stack viewer, uh, you know, a nice detailed breakdown of everything you could possibly uh, be interested in looking at, most likely, uh, in the hopes that you can uh, take this and make good use of it. The paper that introduces weight presents six case studies that suggest that this is actually an interesting tool that can be used to resolve um, these uh, performance uh, problems, including things like deadlocks, uh, server underload, so not sending enough work to a server, which is then sitting idle while others are very busy, uh, memory leaks, database bottlenecks, uh, excess file system activity, uh, spending too much time interacting with disk, uh, we also know is uh, not good for performance, uh, and uh, you can get uh, a nice report. How good these uh, results are at translating into you know, practical things that you're going to use um, you know, in an arbitrary program, I don't know. The uh, six cases that are presented in the paper may just be uh, the uh, typical cooked examples uh, that you sometimes see, where it's like, yes, in this specific scenario, of course it works great. You know, I chose exactly the scenario that it was designed for. Uh, and uh, that would be something to consider. All right, um, there are other um, profiling tools that are kind of interesting to talk about. I mean, there's algorithmic profiling. Um, this is built into Valgrin, which is used to um, help identify um, asymptotic inefficiencies in your code. Uh, and for one or more runs of a program, APROF measures how uh, your program is behaving, and it gives you sort of at a high level, a broad estimate of you know, what is the big O of the program. Uh, and that is sometimes useful. You know, you, if you know it's n squared, uh, you might be concerned. Um, you know, if it's exponential, you have a, a very uh, significant problem. Uh, so that is one of those little things. Um, of course, um, you can profile Python if you want using a profiling tool for Python if you want. Um, Google has a page speed tool, which is profiling for web pages. You can see that, um, you know, how do you make your program faster? Well, uh, how do you make your page faster? Reduce the number of DNS lookups, uh, use the browser cache, uh, combine images, um, traditional JavaScript profiling, you know, the JavaScript stuff just executes as you know, regular JavaScript code. Uh, and you know, we know how to profile code, at least to some degree. Uh, and we could definitely do something like that uh, with JavaScript, just as though it was you know, your C or C Sharp or Java or Rust or anything. Um, you might also remember uh, that I mentioned earlier that I used a profiling tool for CUDA uh, to find out what was wrong with my initial version of the uh, in-body uh, CUDA program. Uh, my initial theory was that a lot of time was spent on, well, loading data and you know, shuffling it around on all overheads uh, and not enough time was being spent actually executing the in-body problem as I wanted. Well, this is what I did. I ran nvprof uh, and uh, then the directory it was in target slash release slash nbody CUDA. That's the name of the executable running it from the directory that I was running in. Uh, and uh, well, here's what I found. Um, so the uh, nvprof breakdown is actually more helpful than I had imagined because it makes clear the distinction between what is an API call and what is like the GPU actually doing work. Uh, and um, so you know, down below we have um, the API call. So these are the things that run in the host code. Uh, and uh, in this case, 97.48% of the time is spent uh, on uh, stream synchronize. That is to say that uh, the time is spent waiting for uh, the 
GPU to be finished, right? It's um, you know it's going to be expensive in in some regard because the uh, GPU is going to be doing most of the work here, uh, and basically um, that cost is now charged to the stream synchronized statement. Even though the stream synchronized statement isn't really doing very much work at all, we're just waiting for the GPU to be done. But it makes some sense to see where is the time going for the host program. Well, it's spending most of its time waiting for uh, the uh, for the GPU. As for the GPU, um, well, uh, here's here's what gave it away. A hundred percent of the time, uh, you know, ten point seven five nine nine seconds was spent on the uh, calculate forces kernel that we wrote earlier. That's what's supposed to happen. That's what's expected. Uh, and virtually none of the time, uh, you know, it shows up as 0, 0.00. Obviously, it's non-zero because of rounding. Was spent on the mem copy, uh, and the mem copies here are actually split up for you conveniently from uh, the, the first one, H to D, that would be host to device. Uh, and the second one is D to H, device to host. So this demonstrated for me uh, very conclusively uh, that uh, there is no chance that my original theory was correct, that uh, somehow all the time was going to transfer of data. Uh, in fact, all the time is going to calculate forces as it should, which tells me that I'm not doing the calculate forces thing in an efficient manner. So I have to change that. And so here's what I did. Uh, here's the one where I make better use of the uh, GPU's capabilities with correct grid and block settings. Uh, and now we can see that, uh, oh, well, the time factor here has decreased. So it's 99.92% uh, spent on calculate forces. Um, but this time it's 417.53 milliseconds. Uh, and you know, there was one call to it. Uh, and uh, you know that, well, makes a huge difference. Huge difference, uh, you know, because that cost gets smaller, all the other ones, which really aren't that different, look bigger by comparison. In the first run here, the CUDA mem copies are respectively 234.72 microseconds and 94.241 microseconds, and over here they're 236 and 93. They don't change, they just look bigger by comparison. Uh, same thing with the API calls now because waiting for the GPU to finish its work is much, much faster. Um, it looks like more of the costs are charged to uh, creating the context and loading data. Um, but in reality, those aren't very different uh, in terms of their actual execution time. You know, 211 milliseconds here and 214 milliseconds here. They haven't changed all that much, um, but the... Um, but the costs being charged uh, more appropriately mean that we end up with those looking bigger uh, in comparison. So yeah, um, you can always uh, make use of the uh, GPU's uh, profiling tool uh, and profile something that otherwise you might you know, have some difficulties figuring out, uh, you know, where is my time going? NVProf is really good at this, uh, and if you have you know, a multiple kernel solution, it can tell you which kernels are taking how much time and uh, really identify for you what's going on.